and I wish to welcome all of you to this uh, first uh, session of conversation with the academy, which is uh, one of the value added programs initiative uh, arranged and organized by the IFA Academy in cooperation with IFA. Uh, I'd like to, uh, today we have with me Dr. Vivian Palacios, who is uh, our digital communication manager, and uh, Jacob Kutz, who is our program manager, and also our co host. Uh, Bruce Altibart from Pfizer, as well as Dr. Paul van der Broeke, who will refer to them in a few minutes. I will spend the next two or three minutes to explain, to discuss with you the conversation with the Academy and the reasons for this program. Next slide, please. So we have the value added programs as a number of initiatives derived from the growing, uh, the growth of the ITAP Academy and its uh, network. Next. Jacob? Yes, as you can see on the slide, the AFF Academy started activities in 2017, and we have grown exponentially in the past four years. And in addition to the initial program, we have now in, uh, other programs, leadership, so collaboration with MAPS. And also we have a, a new certification award, the Global Fellow. So at the end of this year, we have like 600 uh, people affiliated to our network. And we have received, uh, we are pleased with these uh, education services that we are providing, and they have requested us to expand. There is a <coughs> growing sense of community. Next one. Jacob. So what we want to do is to elevate the professional identity and we strengthen the sense of community among our network and bring together and expand to new biomedical professionals involved in medicine development and address hot topics uh, regarding drug development for this growing community level. So basically, these activities are addressed to our alumni, to the global fellows, to our current students, as well as the overall uh, and network of medical affairs and members of the Act of National Member Association. And so we have created this out a value added program and we have the support of our editorial board and the members, uh, experts from IFA and the IFA Academy and from academia, our IFA operations team, as well as Vivian as our digital communications manager. Next one. So you can see on the side the array of CPD activities that we have prepared for 2020 and 2021. Uh, we will start this year with conversation with the Academy. This is the first webinar addressing hot topics in medicine development in addition to monthly newsletters. And this program will continue with panel discussions, interviews, and we intend also to create a community of learning so that uh, this network expands and uh, in the medium term, we can reach the national, the national amended associations, and so our community will be much larger. Next one. And so it's my pleasure to introduce this uh, conversation with the Academy. Today we have the first uh, webinar with antimicrobial resistance with Paul, but then you can see we have other hot topics forecasted uh, uh, to the end of the year including vaccines, digital tools, uh, regulations for clinical trials, and so you are all invited, and you will be invited to attend and join us for these discussions. Next one. So now it's my pleasure to introduce the co-host, my co-host, and the faculty. The co-host is Dr. Bruce Altivot. Uh, and you can see, Bruce is Vice President and Head of the External Medical Engagement with Pfizer uh, Hospital Business Unit. Bruce is a neurophysiologist that has a basic career in basic research and then came into public policy. He earned a doctorate from Harvard, from Harvard University and has been uh, working in public policy for the past 15 years. So he's an expert, particularly in the area of antimicrobial resistance. So uh, thank you, Bruce, for being the focus for, for this program. And then our faculty, uh, next one, a good friend is Paul Vandenbroek. Paul uh, is a, uh, is a really has a distinguished career. 
in pharmaceutical medicine and in health medicine scholar. As you can see in this extensive slide that I will not read, but you can see that Paul has been a, um, critical in developing medicines for Pfizer in many, many areas. I mean, he was one of the responsible for uh, develop, developing medicines for the emerging world. He worked extensively in the development of Lipitor. And additionally, he has had uh, extensive and important senior positions within the organization. Because of this background, uh, Paul serves in the board of a number of nonprofit institutions, particularly related to the area of aging and antimicrobial resistance, in addition to holding academic positions at King's College London. So uh, we are very proud to have him Paul as, uh, as faculty for this uh, session, and uh, I'd like Bruce to take the ball and continue with it further. Thank you, Paul, for your participation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Silva. And if we can move on to the next slide. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. We thank you for taking time out of your day to, to attend this, this webinar. And we, we hope uh, to have a very interactive uh, process here and, and really encourage you to, to ask questions, use the chat function, um, use the, the and, and you will also have some polls. So really would like to make this a discussion as much as possible. And, and we will be monitoring the question panels uh, throughout to address any pertinent questions. If I may have the next slide, please, Jacob. Just a quick legal disclaimer um, for transparency. Uh, these statements uh, represent the personal views of myself and, and of Dr. Vandenbroek. Uh, and we are, uh, of course, Pfizer employees. Uh, thank you. Next slide. Quickly, the learning objectives for today. We want to make sure that, that you have a better and improved understanding of the problem and the risk associated with antimicrobial resistance, uh, its causes, its potential health impacts. Learn about the different tools by which industry leverages to, that industry leverages to combat AMR. Um, we'll provide examples of what we do at Pfizer as well as some other broader uh, industry broad initiatives. I think you'll see that this is not business as usual um, because of the, the risks associated with antibiotics, the critical need to keep them in the cabinet and not bring them out um, until absolutely needed. It's, it's not a volume-based uh, program and really is about appropriate use. And, and we'll discuss how we, we at Pfizer and, and other companies work to ensure the appropriate use of these medicines. And then finally have a conversation about the roles that professionals such as medical affairs and those who in medical development, regulators, other policy officials have in advancing this fight and to address AMR. Next, please. We wanted to start this uh, presentation with, with the first of four polls. This question here is, is important to us as we try to understand what the baseline is for our understanding and where we are as a community on this call. We'd like you to answer this in terms of where do you rank the public health impact of AMR relative to other existing threats, threats, threats such as climate change, cancer, and dementia. So if you can please uh, select one of these, um, and then we'll quickly uh, capture this poll and, and give you the, the outcome. Thank you. I think we have um, many people have already responded. Uh, and uh, maybe if we can, the results are showing on my end that we have about 70% of people showing that it's of greater risk, uh, 23, 25% a similar risk, and 7% and a, a lower risk. So I, I think we'll, it'll be interesting. We're gonna actually come back and have this conversation and, and hopefully we will be able to demonstrate why we believe that it is a, of, of greater risk. So with that, let me hand it over to Paul and we can have our, our more formal presentation, Paul. Great. Great. Thank you very much and uh, um, welcome everyone and thank you for uh, attending this session, which I hope will be uh, very informative and, uh, and will also be uh, more than a presentation, uh, a lively discussion. Uh, it's a real honor for me uh, to be uh, able to open this series of conversations with the Academy and I really would like to thank uh, the IFAP uh, Academy and uh, also, uh, of course, especially Honorio and the team uh, to, um, <clears throat> for this invitation to, uh, uh, to speak. So um, what I would like to achieve uh, with this uh, uh, discussion and this uh, um, uh, presentation is 
to be able to show you not only uh, what uh, uh, AMR represents as a, a global health issue um, and the rising rate of uh, antimicrobial resistance, especially as a global health issue, but also how that is one of those issues where um, medicines development professionals and medical affairs professionals uh, really have to work not only across uh, the company, uh, R&D, medical affairs, uh, <clears throat> regulatory, uh, corporate affairs, uh, policy uh, professionals in the company, and um, but also uh, across society as a whole. And so it really talks about the broader role uh, of pharma in society and the broader role of medical affairs and uh, medical development professionals in uh, that uh, um, in that uh, issue. So uh, in terms of the poll, I was pleasantly surprised, actually. I had uh, uh, expected uh, the uh, percentage of people that think uh, this is a, uh, um, a greater risk uh, than some of the other issues that we face uh, to be much lower. So I'm really pleasantly surprised that a lot of people really already understand uh, the uh, rising threat of antimicrobial resistance. And we'll go into uh, uh, some of the numbers, which are actually quite scary. So maybe we'll go to the next slide and talk a little bit about what is antimicrobial resistance. So as you know, antimicrobial resistance always occurs when uh, pathogens change and find ways to resist the effects of antibiotics. Whenever we use an antibiotic in a particular environment, some pathogens will become resistant. Basically, these are living organisms. And as you may remember, or as you may have read, in the 50s and the 60s, one thought that, uh, and, and a lot of medical professionals thought that with um, that the problem of infection had been solved with the advent of antibiotics. Of course, not taking into account that uh, uh, bacteria um, and uh, uh, fungi and uh, other microorganisms are living organisms uh, that can adapt, and that's what they do. So some of the patterns survive, grow, and they spread their resistance. And then that process of global of, uh, adaptation leads to antimicrobial uh, resistance. Now, the risks of AMR are very serious. And actually, living in a world with COVID-19, uh, we can actually see uh, or have a glimpse of what uh, <clears throat> the world would become uh, if antimicrobial resistance really uh, keeps growing at the rate it is currently. So as we've seen, many routine medical uh, procedures could be too risky to perform because of the risk of uh, becoming uh, infected in the hospital. Uh, serious infections such as pneumonia and tuberculosis could become impossible to uh, treat. And we see already, for instance, with tuberculosis that uh, we have um, situations where that becomes uh, reality. Um, <clears throat> but even more important, minor infections and injuries could, as they were up, to, up until uh, the mid 20th century could become life threatening. Travel could become too risky, impacting global trade, and we've seen this definitely with COVID 19. And <clears throat> one in four infections in uh, long term acute care settings are already caused by antibiotic resistant bacteria. So we're not talking about something that is far away, it is here um, today. Um, so addressing antimicrobial resistance, of course, requires both measures, measures to help uh, prevent and treat resistant infections, which includes the administration of vaccines to prevent infections from happening in the first place, as well as the uh, proper use of anti-infectives to help uh, treat infections. But they also require measures to stimulate the development of new antibiotics uh, to address antimicrobial uh, resistance. Next slide, please. So as you can see here, antimicrobial resistance is a dynamic global issue. And we can see that the resistance levels are uh, very high, uh, but can be different for different types of uh, uh, pathogens. But it is a global issue. Next slide. Um, and it is all the more important since antibiotics are really a backbone of advanced medical care. Um, <clears throat> they really have enabled the development of modern uh, medicine. It would be very difficult to imagine uh, cancer treatment, the care of premature uh, in infants, surgery, organ transplantation, uh, and so on, without uh, the presence of functioning uh, antibiotics. 
And what is more, of course, as, as you can see on the right-hand side, mortality rates have significantly improved with the introduction of antibiotics uh, in, in general. And you can see, for instance, brain infections or heart valve infections, how these have been reduced uh, through the ages as antibiotic uh, use has uh, been introduced. Next slide. So um, the uh, antibiotic resistance, of course, leads to increased mortality, <coughs> longer hospital uh, stays, and higher medical costs. Today, 700,000 deaths per year, 700,000 deaths per year, are um, related to uh, or due to antimicrobial resistance. And in the US alone, we have about 23,000 deaths, deaths per year uh, attributed to antimicrobial resistance. Uh, these, this has, of course, important, an important impact in the cost of care, um, pr primarily because, uh, of, uh, of course, patients have to, be, have to be isolated and also uh, that uh, extra manpower is needed to treat those uh, infections. And that represents about $20 billion in excess healthcare costs in the U.S. alone, for instance. But if we look at 2020, that picture becomes uh, much more, um, much more uh, important. And so we have a projected uh, increase from 700,000 per year to about 10 million deaths per year, as was shown in uh, Jim O'Neill's uh, report, and a cumulative 100 trillion in lost economic output by uh, uh, 2050 due to uh, infections that are resistant to first-line therapy. What we've seen with COVID-19 illustrates this perfectly well. The, uh, there is a tremendous economic impact related to uh, the rise of infectious disease, of an infectious disease like COVID-19, or the rise of antimicrobial resistance. And on the right-hand side, you can see that actually there would be more deaths in 2050 due to antimicrobial resistance than to any other cause, including cancer. Next slide. So we know, of course, antimicrobial resistance is caused by several factors that can be addressed. So this is a difficult situation, but there's hope uh, for this situation. We know what the causes are and we can address them. There's definitely overprescribing of antibiotics. Patients are not taking antibiotics as prescribed. There are unnecessary antibiotics used in our agriculture. Some hospitals still have poor infection control. We have poor hygiene and sanitation practices, although with COVID-19, the public in general is much more, um, <clears throat> much more aware of the importance of uh, hand washing. That's a very positive uh, development. And then uh, last, another cause, of course, is that we have very few rapid uh, laboratory tests, <clears throat> which um, stand in the way of using the appropriate uh, antibiotic for the appropriate infection in the right patient. Next slide. So how can we impact change? Well, first of all, as uh, medical affairs and medical development professionals uh, in the different parts, uh, not only pharma companies, but also across the healthcare spectrum, uh, we can increase awareness uh, of the risks by engaging with stakeholders, healthcare professionals, patients, academia, regulators, policymakers, and government officials, and the public in general. It's a very important aspect of this as well. Uh, we can also advocate for appropriate use of medicines and ensure, and ensure that the right medicine is used in the right patient based on local resistance, resistance patterns. In order to do that, we need to collect and communicate data on resistance to inform practice, work across disciplines to strengthen the available uh, data, advocate for appropriate vaccinations for different age categories, and it is more and more clear that vaccination is something that needs to happen uh, across uh, the uh, age uh, spectrum and that we also need, like we have a vaccination schedule for uh, children, we need a vaccination schedule for older adults as well. Uh, we need to advocate for string, stringent emission, emission controls. We're not talking about CO2 here, we're talking about the emission of antibiotics uh, and API in the environment. And also, of course, very importantly, to help stimulate R&D through the support for regulatory and policy change. And we can, in our discussion, talk about other uh, uh, things that we can do to impact change as well. Next slide. Bruce? So we wanted to pause here and, and 
ask another poll, uh, take another quick poll. Here we want to understand where you are in terms of who has the greatest responsibility for ensuring that uh, healthcare providers, HCPs, and patients undertake effective, appropriate use practices. Is it the pharmaceutical company? Is it professional societies, governments, or the general public? So again, who has the greatest responsibility for ensuring appropriate use of, of our anti-infectives? Pharma, professional societies, governments, or the general public? We're seeing the polls come in. We've got about 60%, 70%, so keep it going for another uh, 10 seconds. Um, and again, just re to remind people, if you do have any particular questions about the, the presentation or the slides that, that Paul just presented, please do not hesitate to put them into the, the chat function. Well, Paul, we're, we just closed the poll and we are at a position where 12% um, said pharmaceutical companies, 40% uh, professional societies, governments, uh, another 40%, and the general public, 6%. I think it's interesting. I, I wonder how this would have changed, Paul, if we had had um, that multiple stakeholders and is, if it's a shared responsibility versus who has the, the greatest responsibility. But let me hand it back to you and you can carry forward. Yes, of course, Bruce, you, you hit the nail on the head, actually. Uh, of course, this is a trick question, right? Because um, the, uh, um, in my personal view, I think it's all of the above, and we purposely uh, did not put in uh, all of the above. Uh, but, um, but good. Uh, it was interesting to see the role of uh, professional societies uh, coming out so strongly, and hopefully in the discussion we can get uh, better insights into this as well, uh, which uh, uh, I think would be uh, very good. Uh, I think we're at 40% there. So, um, and of course, definitely government has to uh, play a role. Um, uh, as well. Okay, uh, next slide perhaps then. Good. So supporting appropriate use. So um, an important component of, um, of the fight against antimicrobial resistance is to use appropriately what we have today. And so we'll talk a little bit about uh, how, what that looks like and what would be, what is needed and what our role is in support as uh, uh, healthcare professionals um, to uh, to support appropriate use in general. So next slide. So of course, antimicrobial stewardship is the key strategy to slow resistance. So what is uh, good antimicrobial uh, stewardship? It is the practice to ensure the optimal selection, dose, and duration of antimicrobial therapy that leads to the best clinical outcome for the treatment or prevention of an infection while producing the, uh, the fewest toxic uh, events and the lowest risk for subsequent resistance. I purposely read this statement because it, I think it really encompasses uh, very well uh, the aim of antimicrobial uh, resistance <clears throat> and that was first written by Dale Girding uh, um, uh, more than 20 years ago. So the, uh, and it is still uh, very valid. Uh, so that, of course, involves coordinated interventions between the different stakeholders. Um, it promotes the selection of an optimal anti-infectious uh, anti uh, uh, regime, regimen, sorry. And I cannot stress this enough, and amongst the benefits, the most important one actually is improved patient uh, outcomes, because of course, we're trying to decrease uh, resistance pressure and use healthcare resources in an optimized way. But the end game here is improved patient outcomes, not only today, but also in the foreseeable future. So antimicrobial stewardship, really key to making sure that we can slow uh, the, uh, uh, the rise of antimicrobial resistance and make sure that the tools that we have today are will be uh, uh, still useful uh, years from now. Next slide. So here we just provide a couple of uh, examples of Pfizer stewardship activities. Um, so we're very active in this. Uh, so Pfizer is one of the few major uh, companies, uh, uh, healthcare companies that is still involved in the development of uh, new antibiotics and antifungals. Uh, and so we have also a lot of uh, different uh, uh, stewardship uh, activities. Very importantly here, it is a global effort and we really need to address antimicrobial stewardship all across the world. Um, 
in the Northern Hemisphere in general, uh, antimicrobial stewardship uh, um, is, uh, is important uh, and has been implemented quite well, especially in the Nordic countries in, uh, in Europe, for instance. Still a lot more work to be done, of course, in the Southern Hemisphere, as we're all aware. Next slide. Um, some other efforts. So uh, we've uh, uh, provided a massive open online course uh, related to antimicrobial stewardship, which is a free online course on antimicrobial resistance and how uh, antimicrobial stewardship can slow down or reduce it. And I would encourage you to have a look at that. Uh, the, uh, we also uh, have uh, put out an ebook uh, which shows how to actually implement an antimicrobial uh, stewardship program in uh, a particular uh, center, and then also we're working together with the uh, British uh, Society on Antimicrobial um, Chemotherapy and uh, through uh, different uh, publications. So this is also part of this uh, work to reach out really to healthcare professionals beyond uh, work that we're doing supporting products or um, that we're really working uh, um, into uh, the uh, with external societies uh, providing tools for free so that uh, physicians and healthcare professionals and policymakers can use them. Next slide. And an important part of this also is ways to reach out to the public in general, because as you know, uh, one of the uh, elements in the rising rate of antimicrobial resistance is uh, an. an the uh, cooperation uh, of uh, or the need for cooperation for the general public, the need for understanding on how uh, antimicrobial stewardship is very important uh, to um, to ensure that uh, we <coughs> can um, that to ensure that uh, the, the tools that we have at our disposal today will still remain useful as long as possible. And so, in that uh, sense, we <coughs> have put together a. Um, Superbugs exhibit where children, uh, but also adults, can learn about uh, antimicrobial resistance and how that is uh, in uh, uh, how that evolves. And that is actually uh, a, an exhibit that has been touring the world, uh, has gone to different uh, uh, cities around the world. Next slide. So we of course cannot do antimicrobial stewardship without knowing what the resistance pattern is in uh, our particular centers, our particular country or region. So uh, antimicrobial uh, resistance surveillance uh, is uh, uh, very uh, important. And so um, the, um, so we need to identify uh, the changes in resistance uh, rates of patent pathogens, uh, the outbreaks of resistant uh, uh, pathogens, and also recognize the emergence of new mechanisms, uh, for instance. Uh, detecting trends and also uh, provide reliable global, regional, and national in vitro uh, susceptibility data. And so uh, the ATLAS system, next slide, the ATLAS system uh, that uh, Pfizer has uh, put in place for uh, about 15 years now, if I can have the next slide, has been uh, essential in providing this. Um, so there's both an antibacterial on the left-hand side and antifungal uh, component on the right-hand side. So as you can see, we have 15 years of cumulative data, and uh, we have uh, we're present in more than 76 uh, uh, countries. And that uh, information is um, is been made available uh, freely. There's even an app uh, that you can use on your phone if you uh, type in uh, in the uh, uh, in, in the App Store. If you type in Atlas Surveillance, you can actually get access to the app. And there's also a website um, there um, to uh, uh, to this. So this really supports stewardship goals and uh, also provides uh, some um, um, and also uh, satisfies some of the regulatory requirements that we have uh, in uh, marketing our uh, antibiotics. And so um, next slide. Here you can see the global reach of the program and uh, so we're in uh, all continents as well. Then we have actually recently also strengthened uh, the um, uh, our uh, presence in Africa through the uh, SPIDER program. Um, next slide. Yeah. Uh, the SPIDER program really strengthened surveillance in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, it is a, uh, um, a uh, partnership and um, actually an antimicrobial resistance 
uh, partnerships are incredibly important because of all the different players that are involved uh, and that should be involved uh, for action. And so we have uh, uh, expanded our Atlas program into Sub-Saharan Africa, working together with, amongst others, the uh, Welcome Fo uh, Foundation and the government uh, of the four African uh, countries uh, involved. Next slide. And one important thing also uh, related to this is, of course, I'm sorry for the SPIDER program, is uh, that we have a real-world evidence study that goes with it so that we can actually relate patient outcomes with resistance patterns in those centers. And we're very hopeful that we can expand uh, those real-world evidence efforts across, uh, across the world as well. Um, I mentioned earlier also, uh, so beyond antimicrobial stewardship and surveillance, the role of vaccines. Uh, in uh, the fight against uh, antimicrobial resistance. Uh, next slide. We should not uh, forget uh, how important uh, vaccines can be in reducing antimicrobial resistance. First, of, of course, uh, through reducing bacterial infections. Um, so the direct impact of uh, having a bacterial uh, vaccine will reduce infection, but also through herd protection, we have an indirect uh, benefit uh, through herd immunity um, the, uh, on the reduction of uh, bacterial infection, hence less need to reduce uh, antibiotics or reduce the consumption of antibiotics through the, uh, through the use of um, uh, vaccines. But perhaps more importantly, uh, when we use uh, uh, vaccines uh, to prevent viral diseases, we actually reduce uh, the use of inappropriate, uh, the inappropriate use of antibiotics um, in uh, viral diseases, um, because we know antibiotics, of course, are uh, um, often prescribed empirically. Uh, and also, uh, we, of course, prevent uh, secondary infections and hence the need to use antibiotics. So vaccines play a very important role in antimicrobial resistance, and again, are becoming more and more important across uh, the uh, life um, uh, in, in the life uh, progression, and uh, especially in older adults as well. Next slide. Then <clears throat> another aspect of the fight against antimicrobial uh, resistance is uh, change in the regulatory framework. So regulatory uh, um, uh, professionals have a very important role to play in antimicrobial uh, resistance. Um, next slide. And in um, in uh, many different uh, aspects of this, so we really have the need to develop a global tiered regulatory framework uh, that uh, allows uh, disease-based or pathogen-based uh, label indications, and also promotes the most appropriate use of new uh, agents. And so there are several uh, things where um, we can move to uh, uh, we can move to uh, uh, greater regulatory flexibility. Uh, so, uh, for instance, adaptive trials, uh, adaptive clinical uh, trials, uh, greater use of surrogate uh, endpoints, uh, and also PK data, uh, non-clinical susceptibility uh, data, and also a tiered regulatory uh, framework where we can both have a disease-based and a pathogen-based uh, label indication. So, the role of regulatory professionals, both in pharma companies and in the regulatory authority uh, is very, very important in this as well. Next slide. Um, an important aspect that is often forgotten uh, and involved the manuf involves manufacturing uh, facility is the environment protection, uh, the role of environmental uh, protection, the manufacturer, the use and also disposal of uh, our medicines and uh, our uh, anti-infectives. Next slide. So there are many sources of antimicrobials in the environment, and as you can see, we have listed uh, a few here. Uh, some of them uh, uh, related to agriculture, uh, companion animals, uh, aquaculture, and so on, but also the manufacturing process. And so manufacturing is one potential source of many, but a potentially a big one. And actually, we've made quite a bit of progress, and as we can see in the next slide, we've made quite a, big, a bit uh, of progress as, uh, pharma, as pharma industry uh, through the work of the AMR Industry Alliance. And so uh, the AMR Industry Alliance, uh, which groups a, a number of um, uh, companies in the sector, uh, has put together a common manufacturing framework. 
has had uh, a predicted uh, no effect concentration science based discharge uh, targets that have been um, put together and is also assessing um, uh, has put a program together to assess sites and supplier uh, sites and uh, to report uh, progress. This is important that not only our manufacturing sites themselves uh, comply uh, with uh, uh, the limits, but also our suppliers uh, who are often based in uh, countries uh, uh, outside uh, the final uh, manufacturing sites, uh, for instance, in India or in China. It's important that suppliers, of course, also comply with those uh, data so that here as well, we can manage antibiotics responsibly. And again, this goes to the general idea here that this issue is much wider than just the healthcare professionals <clears throat> or medical affairs or R&D. The whole um, uh, company and actually society is, uh, is important in uh, addressing this issue. And that also has an impact on how we as medical affairs or uh, development uh, or regulatory uh, professionals approach uh, this issue. Next slide. Good, and then we'll go to Bruce. And Bruce, if uh, there are a few questions, perhaps we can take some time here to address some of the questions as well, or we can take them at the end. Yeah, absolutely. I think it would be great to maybe pause. There have been a couple of questions that have come in directly related to, to the um, uh, slides that you just presented. The first question uh, comes is there, there are many countries throughout Europe and the world that we see higher burden or the, the differing bur burden of AMR. And the lessons are multifactorial or the reasons are multifactorial from local resources, cultural, hospital capacity, healthcare capacity, um, ratios of, of providers, stewardship teams, et cetera. And they were asking if you could elaborate on how we at Pfizer and we as an industry are tackling these factors, where and how are we also partnering with governments to address these challenges? Yeah, yeah, uh, of course. And uh, um, and Bruce, uh, you have been involved in some of those efforts, so it uh, might be good to get your, um, uh, your views as well on this. Uh, but yes, of course, we've been very much involved uh, uh, with this, and um, I personally have met with uh, um, uh, the, the uh, European authorities uh, related to uh, uh, to this as well. Uh, the um, and so uh, we are um, very much uh, involved. Bruce, you want to uh, elaborate perhaps a bit on some of our efforts, as you've been uh, very close to the, to these issues as well. Yeah, I'm happy to. I mean, I think we've we've highlighted some of these in just the slides that we presented in terms of the multifaceted approach that, that we take to this. Through the AMR Industry Alliance, which I'm a, a member, a board member of, we also very actively engage with, with key stakeholders to talk about these issues. I hope many of you hope hopefully have seen um, that the Infectious Disease uh, Society of America, for example, just came out with a new type of guidance. Um, it's not gu clinical guidelines, but guidance to address this very problem where in the past uh, clinical guidelines have been slow to develop because of the evidence base hasn't been there. So through engagements, working with, with um, professional societies like IDSA and government, government recognition about the need for, for more improved uh, uh, inve or, uh, clinical guidelines, apologize, uh, we, we have, we've seen this, this progress. We also work very closely on the on the issue of manufacturing and, and ensuring appropriate use there. We are very, as we talk to governments about the importance of AMR, we very much encourage the continued investment in national action plans and that we need to take these plans from plans on paper to implementation. And that implementation must come with investments. Um, so I think there are multiple ways in which we are doing this through the AMR industry, Alliance through our trade associations, and then directly as we engage with with stakeholders uh, as a company through our education portfolios to, to do this. Paul, yeah. maybe one more question that came in prior to, before we we do this poll um, came from from uh, a colleague actually at Pfizer and asking the question is, do you think COVID will have a positive or negative impact on awareness and the of the threat of AMR with decision makers and the general public? Yeah, yeah, it's a very good question, actually. And I think that um, it, that it will have a very positive impact um, because, uh, as we have seen with COVID-19, 
um, it has really brought to the fore the importance of infectious disease in global public health. And um, I, I cannot remember a time when uh, we had scientists on TV uh, every day talking about infectious disease. Uh, and so I think it really has brought home to governments that they really need to address infectious disease in, in general. Uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, AMR is uh, definitely a part uh, of that. So, so I think it will have a very positive impact. Now, it is incumbent upon us to actually make that happen as well and make sure that once um, you know, this is behind us, that people don't go back to business as usual and, and kind of forget about uh, what happened. It's really important. And that's also why I think it's good to have these discussions like we're having today, uh, where we really raise the awareness and we re really look at how we uh, as healthcare professionals who work in drug development uh, and in medical affairs and regulatory uh, and so on, can really play a very important role uh, by working together with all uh, partners in society to make sure that we address uh, this problem. But I think COVID-19 has really accelerated a lot of things, among them working from home, like we're doing now. Um, and, uh, and I think it is, uh, um, <clears throat> it, is up, uh, it is up to us to make sure that then we use that momentum uh, to uh, further, um, uh, to further um, uh, make sure that AMR is very high on the agenda and that the necessary changes are made. Um, Great, thanks, very good. Paul. Maybe we should switch over to this poll now and and yeah, um, very good. So I think everybody has now seen this question: um, How can governments have the greatest impact on strengthening the antibiotic pipeline? Investing more in basic research. Investing more funding, for example, R&D grants, contracts to companies, uh, improving the valuation and reimbursement systems for antibiotics and anti-infectives, or implementing pull incentives such as market entry awards. Which of these do you feel would be the greatest, have the greatest impact? We'll give it another five, five, 10 seconds as everybody clicks through. It's interesting, Paul. So, so far we are seeing about 10% or so of the respondents answering that we they would like to see more investment in basic research, 25% uh, uh, investing in more funding like grants to direct grants to companies, um, significant number of people believing that the valuation and reimbursement systems uh, need to be impacted. And then finally, uh, about 20% uh, calling for the need for, for pull incentives. I think it's interesting, it, just maybe as we, we transition, Paul, there's another question actually just came in as the poll was going, uh, it, which asks, what is the barrier to the pharmaceutical industry to develop new resistance-free antibiotics? Um, yeah. and, and how do we develop these when, when there's much less compared to other areas such as cardiovascular, cancer, and mental disorders? Great. Uh, great, thanks. Uh, very interesting poll results, actually, uh, and uh, we'll um, address some of these issues, of course, as we go into the next ses uh, session, which has a great, the question that just uh, came in that you mentioned, uh, Bruce, is a great segue to my next session. So thank you to whoever and, uh, asked that question, and hopefully our next slides will, uh, uh, will pr uh, provide uh, an answer uh, to that. Okay, next slide. Very good. So, uh, of course, we've talked about uh, uh, stewardship, uh, surveillance, uh, um, the role of vaccines, manufacturing, regulatory change, and so on. But of course, research and development is really uh, where we will get new antibiotics that then will uh, address uh, the resistance issue that we try to control with stewardship, surveillance, uh, and so on. So let's talk a little bit about research because antibiotic research has a number of aspects, and we're not really going into the technical aspects here of the study design and those kinds of things, but more on um, what are the drivers uh, for R&D and what are the rewards as well. And so you'll, you'll see that, you know, antibiotic R&D, um, you know, is a bit of a, a masochistic uh, uh, activity, uh, if you will, uh, for, for, uh, <clears throat> for companies as we compare this to, for instance, the rewards of uh, cancer research or even rare disease uh, research, as we will see. And as I'm sure a lot of you are aware as well. Next slide. 
So first, very important here, it's a very busy slide, but summarizing it is um, over the years, we have had many antibiotics that have been um, discovered. You can see that that discovery has slowed down in the last few years, that's one. But the second thing also that you can see is that the moment where antibiotic resistance is has identified has really accelerated. So you can see on the left-hand side, penicillin discovered in 1943, and in 1965, so over 20 years later, we saw resistance. If we compare this to uh, other uh, uh, antibiotics, and uh, for instance, why not uh, ceftaroline? 2010, uh, uh, it was uh, um, discovered. In 2011, we already had, uh, it was introduced, sorry. Uh, and in uh, 2011, we already had uh, a resistance uh, identified. So we have a much faster uh, appearance uh, of resistance uh, over the years. Next slide. Um, now, we do have uh, prioritized the need. So WHO has very clearly prioritized those, um, those uh, resist resistance uh, uh, pathogens that really need to be addressed So uh, and divided them in uh, three priorities, critical, and uh, you can see the list here, Pseudomonas, for instance, is on that list. Uh, Staph aureus, Salmonella are on, as high priority and the medium priority, H flu, uh, strep pneumonia, and so on. So, we really have a very clear picture of what needs to be addressed first, and that really guides the few companies who are still in this game, uh, guides their uh, development uh, efforts. So it's clear what we need to address. Next slide. But what we're seeing is that the current pipeline is really not robust enough. We can see that only 41 um, uh, antibiotics are currently in development development and of those actually only 13 in phase three so we have a, if you compare that to the numbers in cancer uh, which are in the hundreds uh, or in the thousands so th this is really uh, a very very low and of those 41 actually only 13 antibiotics have the potential to treat critical threat pathogens so what's happening with this next slide well a, a, a big culprit here is the commercialization of antibiotics. It's very different from what we see in the usual pharma revenue uh, module, uh, uh, model, uh, where innovation really leads to higher volume of sales and attractive prices. And we see this, for instance, again, in cancer, neurology, uh, any other, and we'll see a list of that in, in one of the next few slides. Um, what, what, what happens for antibiotics is actually that innovation uh, the bigger the innovation, actually, the more likely that the antibiotic will not be used. So innovation actually decreases volume, and it actually has a limited effect on price. So what, what happens is that when you develop an antibiotic, you really have very unpredictable and very low revenue. So the overall commercial model, let's say, for um, antibiotics is uh, not conducive to a large investment in development. Next slide. And that, of course, translates in a, uh, uh, a long path uh, to profitability. Uh, the development of an antibiotic, as you can see here, uh, takes, it takes more than uh, 23 years to actually achieve a profit. We're not even talking about uh, um, necessarily um, a large uh, profit or a very sustained uh, profit. As you can see, this is very close to the uh, patent uh, <coughs> expiry. Next slide. And here we have this uh, comparison with other therapeutic areas. As you can see, it's not only oncology, respiratory disease, dermatology, etc. In green, uh, you uh, see the financial uh, upside, uh, and in red, you see the investment. And so you can see that actually antibiotics from an investment perspective are underwater um, compared to, and, and definitely when one compares them to other um, therapeutic areas. Next slide. As a result, we have a lot less, uh, not only a lot less antibiotics being developed, but also those that come to market actually uh, are um, commercial flops and really have led to uh, companies that created them to file for uh, bankruptcy of being sold off for pennies on the dollar. 
And as you can see here, of the uh, 15 uh, antibiotics that uh, have been uh, developed in the last 10 years, uh, five of them are actually uh, a bit limited uh, availability or no availability anymore, mainly because some of those companies have been uh, have gone uh, bankrupt. Okay, very good. Uh, next slide. Um, then, um, so of course, so that raises the question of incentives to develop new antibiotics, and so. IFPMA has um, developed positions on different types of incentives, and as, as you saw from the poll question as well, there are the different types are push poll and reimbursement and HTA. So push really uh, are mechanisms that push mechanisms are mechanisms that reduce the risk of early investment uh, in antibiotics, and that can be combined with some regulatory reform, as we uh, mentioned earlier. So an R&D tax credit. Uh, grants, uh, uh, harmonization of uh, regulatory requirements uh, uh, are in this uh, category. It mainly affects investment in preclinical and early clinical investments. The mm, pool mechanisms basically aim to provide a higher reward for innovation that, as we can see, is currently not uh, available um, in the current model. Uh, but uh, so with pool me mechanisms, we get a higher rewards for innovation, particularly early in the product life cycle. When the use is low and so that helps of course with the predictability of uh, uh, the reward for developing um, a drug so an example of that is market entry rewards you get a large amount of money when you develop a new antibiotic independently of uh, the sales that you would get or you can transfer the exclusivity the patent that you have on this particular drug to another uh, drug that you have in your portfolio which may be much more profitable. So those are some of those mechanisms. And then uh, reimbursement, of course, is important as well. So that enables appropriate access. <clears throat> and really, the reimbursement reflects not only uh, the cost of the drug, but also reflects the, the value society puts on novel antibiotics. And uh, an analogy there might be, for instance, the investment that we make in, um, uh, in uh, fire uh, brigades, for instance. So we pay, as a society, we pay for a fire brigade in every town, um, but uh, we don't pay the fire brigade every time it is used. And so there's similar ideas there uh, as well. We recognize the value of the creation of new antibiotics for society. And so in some cases, we, we may perhaps not pay for the antibiotics every time it is used, but for the availability of antibiotics uh, in general. That's one of the models, uh, uh, potential models there. Next slide. So we have made progress, and especially in push funding, uh, Carbex, for instance, uh, uh, the MR Action Fund, uh, and so on, have really uh, increased uh, the amount of uh, funding early on in the cycle. There's been very advanced discussions on reimbursement in HTA, and especially in uh, uh, the UK, for instance. Uh, we have uh, a couple of mechanisms that look very promising. Uh, FDA um, has been involved, and also we have a number of acts in the US, uh, amongst them the Pasteur and the Disarm Act, and Bruce has been involved with some of these, um, where you know we see a real potential progress on reimbursement and health technology assessment. Uh, and then uh, also in general, uh, we have an improved visibility and recognition uh, of the industry, uh, the MR Industry Alliance that uh, Bruce is uh, on the board of, but also the Access to Medicine Fund is focusing really very much on uh, AMR as an issue to be addressed by uh, pharmaceutical companies and is rating pharma companies um, uh, on, on these efforts. As you know, Pfizer uh, was rated very well last time this was done. Hopefully that continues and we were able to continue our efforts uh, related to antimicrobial resistance. Now, on the next slide though, we will see that uh, the, uh, this actually is not sufficient uh, to support sustained investment. And uh, we really have not made real progress on pull incentives. Um, <clears throat> and um, so there's an economic problem, but the solution is political. And in an environment where uh, pharma companies are really looked at uh, very negatively by the public in general, it's very, uh, very difficult politically uh, to um, promote new incentives uh, for the introduction of a particular drug. And actually, there's quite a bit of pressure on the industry. And Jim O'Neill himself actually um, 
uh, seems to indicate uh, that uh, um, the uh, uh, that perhaps government intervention in this uh, would be uh, needed. So um, the good thing, though, is that uh, a new alternative proposals have been uh, presented in the past few months. And again, it is important for us as professionals involved in this area to support those uh, proposals uh, and to um, uh, talk about them, to be armed with knowledge uh, and to also hire the people that have the right skills uh, to do this. Um, to uh, be able to be uh, effective interlocutors for governments, policymakers, international organizations, NGOs, uh, uh, civil society, and so on. Next slide. So again, how can we impact change? I've talked about uh, a lot of this over uh, the presentation. First of all, we should support governments in establishing market-based incentives. Um, strengthen the ecosystem through regulatory and uh, um, HDA uh, change to improve the market conditions uh, in general. Uh, but more importantly, really be a key partner in product and business development, ensuring that the investments uh, are prioritized to address not only the current, but also the future uh, needs. And so really generate scientific, regulatory, medical and development insights uh, to inform uh, the strategy. Uh, Real-world evidence is really important to uh, support improve, improved uh, um, medical insights to inform uh, uh, strategy. Uh, so also to support the development of policy positions uh, to ensure that they prioritize uh, public health need and appropriate use uh, provisions are constructive. And also, very importantly, we are um, experts in our different, uh, different areas and can be a very trusted voice with KOLs, policymakers, regulators, government officials, and patients. And as you uh, have seen with COVID-19, actually how scientists, uh, physicians, uh, epidemiologists uh, have really um, been a very important trusted voices to inform uh, the public in general, to inform um, the uh, uh, government, policymakers, uh, uh, and so on. I think there's a very strong analogy there uh, as well. Um, very good. So um, then if we can have the next slide. Very good. Um, so that's uh, then the poll. Bruce, are you taking the poll? Should I take it? I think, yeah, we just wanted to close by going back to the question we started with, if we could have the poll, Jacob, and just to get your understanding again of, now that you've heard this presentation, has there been a shift in your view? If Does does AMR pose a greater risk, a uh, similar risk, or lower risk than climate change, cancer, dementia? And if you remember, we started, Paul, at, at the level where we were about at 70% felt it was greater risk and about 23% uh, felt it was a similar risk. So I, I think as we close the poll now, um, it's certainly seeing a, a pretty uh, yeah, similar, actually similar uh, numbers, I think, right now, where again, we um, are at about 70% uh, at greater risk um, and 29% at, at lower risk. I think, again, in the interest of time, there was one question that, that came in that I, I thought we could close with, and then we can hand it over to Honorio to, to close our meeting. And the question was, um, there's a, a pharmaceutical company, there are some, a number of pharmaceutical companies, uh, one in the Netherlands that no longer uh, use sales bonuses for antibiotics for the sales force to show the responsibility regarding AMR. And wanted to get your thoughts in terms of the value, the impact of, of activities such as this. Yeah. Um, my presentation has been mainly focused, of course, on the medical and medical development uh, uh, regulatory side of things. Uh, but I think those initiatives are uh, great uh, because uh, it is really very important to de-link uh, um, this uh, sales incentives from antibiotic use. And it can uh, have one additional uh, um, contribution to uh, reducing the risk of antimicrobial resistance. At the same time, honestly, I have total confidence in uh, uh, physicians and other healthcare professionals. And, uh, and I don't think that, uh, um, I don't think that uh, uh, physicians would be too uh, uh, influenced by uh, promotion for uh, antibiotic use. But, uh, but still, I think it's a great step forward uh, also to show uh, society in general that we really mean this. 
and that we really want to be a partner and a contributor in the fight against antimicrobial rising uh, antimicrobial resistance. Very good. I guess we can go to the conclusion then. Yeah. So uh, the uh, so I think uh, hopefully with uh, uh, you all agree that AMR is an existing public health crisis, and I was uh, glad to see that uh, uh, the poll results at the end actually are substantially different from what we had at the beginning. Uh, and uh, and so this uh, public health crisis likely uh, being made worse by COVID-19. Uh, in the sense that, of course, we're using uh, much more uh, empirical um, uh, antibiotics. Uh, of course, the evidence for, still, uh, for this still uh, is in the works, but uh, it looks like uh, AMR might increase uh, due to uh, COVID-19. On the other hand, of course, the awareness of infectious disease in general, as uh, we discussed, uh, has be become much stronger uh, thanks to COVID-19. And uh, so hopefully that will have an impact on how governments, the public in general, uh, and policymakers uh, view antimicrobial resistance. So uh, action is needed uh, now to ensure healthcare does not uh, revert backwards. Uh, we play a key role in addressing AMR, ensuring a, uh, uh, um, appropriate use, supporting development of antibiotic pipeline, uh, encouraging and establishing multi-sector partnerships, uh, and engaging with policy and stakeholder uh, communities to advance policies that will meet the need of the patients. And so, in general, hopefully I've uh, convinced you that this is an example of the need for a stronger role of medical affairs, medicines, development professionals, regulatory professionals, development professionals in external engagement and also to support policy development for the long-term benefit of patients worldwide. And I thank you so much for um, being here and for uh, your great questions. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Honorio. Thank you, Paul and Bruce, for this fantastic event. This has been a great kickoff for our conversations with the Academy. We certainly have induced a change in our perception on the risk of antimicrobial resistance and be sure that this community of medical affairs professionals or individuals involved in medicine development will are now aware of the, the, the need to work together and support the initiatives that you have mentioned. And I invite all the attendees to uh, get organized and be vectors uh, for uh, addressing the problem of antimicrobial resistance in your respective communities and work with the network to create further awareness and help in the initiatives that were prepared by Paul. So Paul, Bruce, uh, again, thank you very much for this fantastic webinar. Uh, you are will be always welcome to continue discussing about this subject. And uh, I invite the community to start discussing and the IFAB Academy can serve as a vehicle for networking and for further discussion and consulting with Paul Andrews. So thank you again. And uh, I cannot say this, this is the best way to start our conversations with the Academy program. For the attendees, uh, you will receive a webinar. Uh, at this webinar, you will receive a poll, uh, out of a survey uh, regarding your perception and asking for feedback to this presentation. And the webinar has been recorded. And uh, we look forward to having you again on October 1st for our next conversation that will be about vaccines. Again, Paul, Bruce, fantastic. And if you want to say something else, please take the mic. Um, uh, yes, no, th thanks everyone. Uh, it really was uh, um, a, a great experience for us, uh, for Bruce and myself. Uh, and so uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to uh, uh, to have this discussion with you and uh, really looking forward to your comments and uh, see anything that we can uh, improve and address. So it will be uh, uh, <clears throat> very nice to be able to do that. Thanks again. Thank you.